Hello. Hello, is this Max Bear? Yes, it is. Hello, Max. This is Dustin Wilmis from KMSU Radio. How are you today? How are you? Where are you at? I am in Minnesota. Oh, okay. Is this a good time to ask you a few questions? Sure. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, I, gu- I guess I'll kind of get a sense of, you know, how you started in acting or what made you want to get into it. Oh, I was just an accident. I was at lunch at Warner Brothers one day. Somebody took me over there, a friend of mine. And, uh, they saw me on the lot, and uh, James Garner had just left Maverick. Uh, and they were looking for somebody to put in Maverick, and... Uh, I resembled Jimmy a little bit because somebody from ABC saw me and thought I was him at a distance. And uh, so they asked me if I ever wanted to act, and I said, I don't know, what does it pay? (laughs) (laughs) And uh, they said, uh, you know, they they would sign me to it, uh, a regular, uh, what do you call it? I can't remember the name that they called it. Uh, Just a general contract player. I think it was 250 a week. This was in 1960, and uh, so I said, okay, let me, I'll try, and I went ahead and I did a reading for him, and a no screen test, I just did a reading for him, and uh, they signed me, and I did Surfside 6, 77 Sunset Strip, Hawaiian Eye, Bronco Cheyenne, Maverick, uh, Roaring Twenties, I did all those shows that they had over there on ABC at the time, and um that's where I got my my uh, my bone, so to speak, because that's where I learned a little bit about the camera and where to go and so forth, and uh, all small parts. But um, it was a good education. And then I, when I left there after a year, I was only under contract a year. I did a couple of other shows, and then I tested for the Beverly Hillbillies, got that, and I was on that for nine years. Yeah, definitely interesting uh, how you just kind of fell into it. And I know, of course, your father, uh, a boxing great, former champion. Was that ever something you considered, maybe going uh, the boxing route? No, my dad said boxing was a religious sport. It was far better to give than receive, and I didn't have any religious feelings at the time, so I didn't go that way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, obviously things uh, worked out well for you in your field, and can you tell us a little bit about uh, what it was like, uh, you know, as Jethro on Beverly Hillbillies, the you know, the filming or your memories of being on set? Well, since I had been at Warner Brothers for a year and I had been working constantly because they, they took their contract players and used them a lot. They just, they used them in everything because they were figured, they were paying them so they'd put them in everything and anything. You know, you took the part, it didn't matter what it was. Um... So they used you up, because if they had to pay somebody else, a freelance player, they had to pay them like, I think it was $400 a day. So they had you for 250 for a week, and so they used you in everything. And uh, so when I did the Hillbillies, it was like, uh, it was easy. It was like, uh, you know, it was like pumping gas. You just went to work and you did your job. It, it wasn't that difficult for me, I guess. Um, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I've always been kind of a, an introvert, but it was very easy for me to turn the other way. I guess it was like being a, uh, one eyed Jack, you know, you have one eye on one side, one eye on the other side, and you have two different personalities and I could just become the other one very easily. It was not that difficult for me. So then, uh, portraying Jethro for you know, 270 plus episodes. Did that, did that ever get hard for you or was it just kind of uh, part of your acting? Like you mentioned, it got easier. I, you know, you could almost phone it in. The only t- thing I did one time is I made a mistake and I never used an accent and nobody knew what was wrong with the scene, but it didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> and I talked in my own voice and, and they said, I said, did I, did I miss the wrong things? And they said, no, I said, well, what was it? And then one of the persons said, he didn't have any accent. And I went, oh, okay, for, sorry, I forgot it. You know? And that was basically about it. But it wasn't difficult. I'm sure there are, there were, there are parts that, that people play that are very difficult. Like uh, people play, you know, the Elephant Man, for example. Uh, John Hurt, I think it was. John Hurt. Um, or William Hurt. No, it was John Hurt, I think. But anyway, that was a very difficult part to play. 
you know, I would think. And, uh, you know, but, but that part wasn't, wasn't hard at all. At least not for me. <laughs> maybe playing the fool was not a problem because, you know, maybe I was one, but, uh, no, it wasn't hard. Well, yeah, definitely a, a character that a lot of people loved. And, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, nine seasons, is it possible for you to pick a, maybe a favorite episode or performance you're most proud of? Oh gosh, no, there really isn't. It's just, you know, when you play a character, it's, uh, it's so repetitious. I'm just going to get a drink of water here because uh, I I stay up late and uh, sleep late and I talk like I got a mouthful of marbles. <laughs> anyway, I um, I really don't have any favorite because you're playing the same character over and over and it's pretty hard to pick out who you really like and who you don't. You know, it, I mean, which one, which particular episode out of 274. I am I enjoyed it if I was having a good if it, if I had a if I had some good scenes to do in the doing it it was fun if I was doing them with girls it was fun because I was a young guy then and so that was fine but um, I really don't have one. Well, I have to say uh, for me personally, one thing that I really enjoyed and I'm it's too bad that more shows don't do these nowadays. But you guys recorded an actual uh, soundtrack album. What are your memories of doing that? Terrible. <laughs> because I'm not a singer, um, nor a dancer. And uh, they just had us do it because at the time it was it was a popular show and it was another means of uh, generating revenue. And so they just had us do it. Uh, Irene could sing. Um, Buddy could uh, could sing, I think. I'm, I'm not, I, I knew he was a great tap dancer. And... Uh, and Donna, I guess, could sing a little bit, but I was I was no singer at all. I think there is a kind of a certain charm to some of that old stuff like that, though. Yeah, I I guess there is, but um, you know, like I guess there's a collectible or something. But good gosh, and you know, I was terrible. I mean, uh, I couldn't pat my head and ro- roll my hand on my stomach uh, at all. I mean, I was not. Um, it was hard for me to clap on, clap on time. I, it was just not my. It was not what I was qualified to do. Sure. Well, and of course, it's uh, sad to hear Donna Douglas. She played Ellie May, passed away recently. Were you close with the cast after the show ended over the years? Um, well, Irene died right after the show was over. The show was over in '71, and I think she died right, right then, '71 uh, or '72. She went on to Broadway and did Pippin with John Rubenstein and uh, Ben Breen. And then she got sick on stage and came back and she got pneumonia or something and went to the hospital or had a stroke or something and then passed away. But Irene and I were very close on the road. We were we would go out almost every weekend when we were on the Beverly Hillbillies and do personal appearances. And I really wouldn't sing a song, you know, but we would sing his group and they would turn Donna's mic and my mic down and Irene would basically carry it and we were we were just basically filler or background sounds pretty much and then I was a straight man for uh, for uh, Irene for the granny's jokes and so Irene and I were were pretty close because of that and Buddy was more of a surrogate father to me because my dad had just died in 1959 and this was 1962 and so he kind of took over. He was the same age as my dad, born about the same time. And uh, he knew my dad pretty well. So it was it was pretty easy for me and, and for Buddy and I to become close. I would go down there. He tried to teach me to sail on his uh, 36-foot Lapworth down in Balboa Island where he had a house. And uh, as, as a sailor, I was a very good anchor because I, it was hard for me <laughs> <laughs> the first time he ever had me on the boat, he says, now when when the boat comes about, he says, uh, you just pull in on the winch. And I said, okay. He said, now make sure you pull in quick, because if you don't, the sail will fill up with air, and it'll be too hard to pull in. And so the first time he we were out, and he said, coming about, I stood up, and what? Bang, the boom hit me and knocked me right in the ocean. Wow. And uh, <laughs> he was laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he said, "He said, well, I guess you can forget about being a sailor too." But uh, 
he and I used to go out and have dinner like oh, once a week. We'd go out to some place. He'd take me to a to Musso Frank's on on Hollywood Boulevard or the Cook Specific Dining Car. He had some little places he would take me to. And sometimes at lunch, uh, he had a little guy named George George who would come over and cook for him in his dressing room, and he'd invite me up to his dressing room and, and have lunch with him. That's if we didn't have too much to do in the afternoon because he it was either a one or two martini lunch because if he didn't if he had to remember some lines he'd have, he'd have a one martini lunch if it was or if he had to remember lines it was one if it, he didn't have a lot of lines in the afternoon he may have two sure <laughs> and that was pretty much it but we were pretty close Donna was pretty independent of everybody she she kind of went her own way except we were together on the road when we did our uh, our personal appearances but Donna was always sweet. She was always sweet. I, the one thing I can remember about her, and I've told other people the same thing, in all the years that I knew her, I never heard her swear ever. She'd go, golly, gee, darn, uh, dang. She'd whistle. She'd son of a gun. She just never used four-letter words at all. Never did. And the last time I actually saw her was about a year ago, to, or two years ago today, or right in this time, we were in Los Angeles for the only autograph signing I've ever been to. She'd done some before, but um, they called and tried to put the two of us together for once. And I said, okay. And I had to go there for something else anyway, because I live at Lake Tahoe. But I drove down to Los Angeles, and um, we went to uh, Century Boulevard at some hotel. I can't remember. And we were there for two days, and uh, we did very well. And Donna seemed fine. Uh, but I'd see her periodically. I saw her at Buddy's test, uh, Buddy's uh, a funeral. I saw her when we went to the hospital for Buddy to see him when, before he'd passed away. And then I saw her at, um, oh, where else was it? I saw her at, uh, oh, then they had a um, kind of a tribute to, to Buddy at the Screen Actors Guild. And I went, th- I went for that down in Burbank. Or down in yeah, I think it was you know it was in San Fernando Valley in North Hollywood, where the Screen Actors Guild uh, Theater is out there. So yeah, it's uh, it sounds like you guys were uh, pretty close knit, and you know obviously fifty years later, people still love the show. What do you think it is exactly about the show that's made it last so long? Well, you know, opinions are like rear ends; we all have one. I if if I knew, I'd be doing making television shows right now, or producing them anyway. Because nobody knows what makes a hit. If anybody did, they'd never have any failures. Because they could take and figure out what it was and put it into some computer and it'd spit it out. But they still do the same thing that they used to do, which is do a pilot, which is a sample show, and see, play it for different audiences and see what the reactions are. And then the networks figure out or now now more than the networks it used to be just abc nbc cbs but now they've got all kinds of different networks and they see if it fits into their niche what they're what they feel that they're missing uh for that part of programming on their network and uh, i have no idea what ruler that they use never have it never have known I guess Steven Spielberg has probably got as good an idea, and George Lucas has got a good as, as good an idea as anybody. And they just said, "Well, I, I think if I like it, probably most of the people will like it. Not everybody, but most of them, because they figure that they look at them pretty much like they're average people, and uh, that they've just got their finger on the pulse of America." But I really don't know why it was was successful. I wish I did. Yeah, well. Uh... No doubt it is successful and uh, people still talking about it. And I know you kind of got into uh, more of the business side of things afterwards, but is there anything else you are, you're working on or anything coming up? No, 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 no. Um, I'm, well, let's see, Donna was, I think, 82. I'm 77. I'll be 78 this year, but I just turned in uh, uh, December. Uh, as a matter of fact, I never actually knew how old Donna was. I knew she was about but never actually. She would never really respond to that. But that's okay. Uh, no, I, you know, 
what do you do at, 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 at my age? You know, not a heck of a lot. Plus, it was so hard for me to lose the Jethro character. Uh, that's why uh, I really couldn't get any jobs after the series was over. Not really. And so I wrote and, with Richard Compton and wrote uh, Macon County Line and went and made, uh, raised some money from some of my golfing friends and made them made that movie up in uh, Northern California, up near my hometown of Sacramento. And uh, I don't know why that was a success either. And it, it was the largest grossing movie per dollar invested at that time ever made. And it did about, mm, 20, we made it for 110000 and made $25 million. So it was gross $25 million, So it was pretty successful. And then we made Ode to Billy Joe from the Bobby Gentry song. Because my partner knew Bobby Gentry when she was a kid playing uh, her guitar in Westwood. Well, I think she was going to UCLA. And she was on the, you know, on the corner like the kids were uh, in those days. And she was just playing her guitar, and people were giving her money. And she was a beautiful girl. And my partner took her to coffee, and and uh, she wound up doing the music, the song at the end of Macon County Line, another time, another place. And uh, then she said, "Well, would you like to do Ode to Billy Joe?" And I tried to write it. I couldn't write it, and so we got Herman Rauscher who wrote Summer of 42 to, to write it. And then Warner Brothers dis- decided that they would uh, give us a distribution deal. And then we went down to Tupelo, Mississippi, and, and, uh, or Tallahatchie, near the Tallahatchie Bridge in Greenwood, Mississippi, and shot the movie. And I directed it with Robbie Benson and Glennis O'Connor. And, uh, and that was a hit. So now I bought a lot of real estate. <laughs> <laughs> and then in 1991, I uh, made a deal to a license, sub-license the rights to the Beverly Hillbillies for certain things like hotels, casinos, restaurants, et cetera. And um, we've, um, we made a deal with uh, International Gaming Technology, IGT, and they've been doing slots, Beverly Hillbilly slots now for about 10 years. And we get a royalty on them, of which we pay some to CBS. And then I have also online games uh, because of the same individual that was with CBS. I mean, was with IGT and is now uh, with uh, Aristocrat, but he also has an online gaming company. And we became very friendly, and so he wanted to do those games online. And so we're doing online games, too. Excellent. Well, again, Max, it's uh, great to hear that you're doing well, and it's been an honor talking with you today. Well, look, it is it, at my age, the thing you think about first, I guess, is your health, because uh, it's the only thing that when they cancel that, they, they don't pick, there's no way to pick up the show. And that's it. <laughs> and uh, I was sorry, sorry to lose Donna, because Donna and I would talk periodically between uh, where she was when she was on the road doing different things for uh, she would do uh, Christian shows and sing in churches and do personal appearances like that. If something came up that she was called upon that might have pertained to me, she would try to turn me on to it. It never really happened that I did anything that way, but a few times they did call me about Donna, and i steer Donna into the job. We would do it for each other, you know. Same way with that autograph signing thing. They called me, and then I... They wanted to reach Donna, so I gave them a number that they could reach her at. They put us together. But she was a sweetheart. She was always nice. She was always fun. She was very different because myself, if I wasn't either being recorded or on the air, I talked like a truck driver, talked like a guy in the military, surrounded by other guys with no women around. He used a lot of four-letter words probably, and it's not love. It might be for love, but it isn't. You don't say love is like being the four letter word. You say everything else but. But uh, hey, look at such as life. I've had a very, very fortunate life, pretty full. And uh, as a matter of fact, I can still get in the same Levi's I wore when I was uh, doing the series. Beautiful. That, that is what. That is probably as much as I'm. I'm most proud of that because I uh, I kept one pair of Levi's. And once a month, I try them on. And as long as I can get into them, that's okay. (laughs) And I work out three days a week pretty hard. Wonderful. Thanks again, Max. It's been great having you on.
you're you're very welcome. Thank you for thinking of me, and uh, you know, keep good thoughts for Donna because she was a terrific person. Absolutely. Thanks so much. All right. You have a great day. All right. You too. Bye bye.